This morning's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 through 35. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible translation. Exodus chapter 32 verses 1 through 35. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron replied to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it into an image of a calf. Then they said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it and made an announcement. There will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. Early the next morning, they arose, offered burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. The Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people you brought up from the land of Egypt have cor acted corruptly. They have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger can burn against them, and I can destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, why does your anger burn against your people you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out with an evil intent to kill them in the mountains and eliminate them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger and relent concerning this disaster planned for your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac and Israel. You swore to them by yourself and declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and will give your offspring all this land that I have promised and they will inherit it forever. So the Lord relented concerning the disaster he had said he would bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down on the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, inscribed front and back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. But Moses replied, It's not the sound of a victory cry, and not the sound of a cry of defeat. I hear the sound of singing. As he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses became enraged and threw the tablets out of his hands, smashing them at the base of the mountain. He took the calf they made, burnt it up, and ground it to powder. He scattered the powder over the surface of the water and forced the Israelites to drink the water. Then Moses asked Aaron, What did these people do to you that you have led them into such a grave sin? Don't be enraged, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know that the people are intent on evil. They said to me, Make gods for us, who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I said to them, Whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me. When I threw it into the fire, out came the scar. Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control, making them a laughing stock to their enemies. And Moses stood at the camp's entrance and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites gathered around him. He told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Every man fasten his sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from entrance to entrance, and each of you kill his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 men fell dead that day among the people. Afterwards, Moses said, Today you have been dedicated to the Lord. 
since each man went against his son and his brother. Therefore, you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. The following day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a grave sin. They have made a god of gold for themselves. Now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. See, my angel will go before you. But on the day I will settle accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for what they did with the calf Adam had made. This is the word of the Lord. Today, we continue our sermon series through the book of Exodus with chapter 32. And if this is your first morning with us today, it will be very helpful to know what happened before, what did we study before. The book of Exodus is the second book of Moses and it began with God's rescue of ancient Israel from slavery, from oppression in Egypt. And then in the first 18 chapters, we have seen how God had been faithful to them throughout the Exodus from Egypt and then the following journey through the wilderness. In chapters 19 to 24, we have seen how God established a covenant, an agreement, a mutual agreement with, between himself and the people of Israel. And this covenant included the Ten Commandments and further instructions. And then in chapters 25 to 31, we have seen that God communicates, that he speaks through Moses. And he tells him how he wants to be present among his people, how he wants to be worshipped by his people. In our last sermon of this series two weeks ago, we have learned about the instructions related to the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And we have seen that God intended this day to be a rest day, a day as a blessing, as a delight for his people, a day that would allow to focus on him and his word in a special way. And we have seen how this, this rest day pointed already towards the ultimate rest that is found in Jesus. But what happens in our text today? Yes, the people mess up. As we have already heard in the scripture reading, in their impatience, they break God's commandments. And we will see that this was not at all a small issue. This was not just a minor incident. We will see that Moses had to mediate, to intervene between the people and God. And we will see that this incident had serious consequences. In our confession text this morning in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, we have read that this incident took place as an example, as an example for us today. It was written down for our instruction. And we will see today that idolatry, that idols are not neutral. We will see that Moses' intercession points already to the ultimate intercessor, the ultimate mediator between God and humans. And finally, we will see that God is faithful. Before we have a closer look at our text, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you. We come to you this morning because you are the only one who truly deserves our worship. You are the Holy One, the creator of heaven and earth the Almighty One. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the Holy Scriptures. We thank you for your speaking to us through your word. We thank you for your servant Moses who brought this, this incident down so that it may serve for our instruction today. 
And as we want to have a closer look at this text, we ask you, Lord, to open our eyes, that we may see what you want us to see. Lord, we pray that you give us understanding. Oh Lord, may your word accomplish what you please to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We can divide this chapter, this long chapter, in four parts, in four scenes, to, so to say. Scene number one is people doubt and Aaron fails. The people doubt and Aaron fails. That's verses one to six. The people doubt and Aaron fails. Scene number two is God's anger and Moses' intercession. God's anger and Moses' intercession in verses 7 to 14. Scene number three, Moses' anger and the Levites' action. Moses' anger and the Levites' action. That's in verses 15 to 29. And then the final scene of the chapter, the final part, scene number four, Moses' intercession and God's punishment. Moses' intercession and God's punishment. That's what we read about in verses 30 to 35. So let's get started with scene number one, people doubt and Aaron fails, verses one to six. What had happened to this Moses? Was Moses still alive? That's what the people were wondering about. As we have seen some weeks ago at the end of chapter 24, God called Moses to come up to the mountain to receive from God the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. And before he actually went up to the mountain, he had appointed Aaron and who are as acting leaders to take care of the people. We have also seen that the Israelites, they had seen God's amazing glory that appeared as a, as a fire, as a consuming fire we read on the mountaintop. And then, then their faith and their patience were tested. Day after day, after day, after day, after day, and Moses just did not return from the mountaintop. Moses would eventually stay on the mountain for a total of 40 days and nights, more than a month. But instead of remembering God's commandments and trusting God, or at least asking Aaron or Hur for advice, they gathered against Aaron and demanded from him to make gods for them. Now, asking for gods, plural, reflected how much they were influenced by the polytheism, by the belief in, in multiple deities. That's what they had seen, that's what they had experienced in Egypt. Maybe they thought this one God, who was represented by this one man, this Moses, has disappeared, just as Moses had disappeared. However, they want again a protecting power that goes before them in the same way as Yahweh, the Lord, went before them when he had led them out of Egypt. They felt need for guidance. They felt need for protection. They knew that difficult times were ahead of them. And they demand something visible they could see. And Aaron, we don't know exactly what Aaron felt, but whatever it was, it does not excuse his response. He gives in to the pressure of the people. Now he could have consulted with Hur, he could have consulted with the other elders, but instead he joins and supports the people in falling into idolatry. We see that the Israelites believed that this image of a calf, this young bull, represented Yahweh, the true God who brought them out of Egypt. 
And on the following day, they brought offerings. But different from the earlier covenant celebration they had in chapter 24, this was now about eating and drinking and having fun. From the reference in 1 Corinthians 10, we know that getting up to party included also immoral behavior. Breaking God's commandments leads to unholiness, it leads to corruption. Now just think about this. This was outrageous. They forgot God their Savior who rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Without him, they would not have been alive anymore, most likely. Who had revealed himself to them? They forgot that they had promised to keep the good commandments that their living God had given to them. And instead, instead, they worship a dead piece of metal. Unbelievable. But instead of pointing fingers at the Israelites, let's have a look at us. Of course, we know God's promises, but how easily do we get impatient and think we need to act? Does this sound familiar? For example, you're praying already for a long time for healing, and you trust that God can heal you at his time. And then you come across this self-appointed healer, impatience. Or our students, you are preparing for exams. You are studying hard. And you know that God can take your anxiety. He can take your nervousness away at his time. And then a classmate has some sort of pills that supposedly improve your concentration. Impatience. Impatience leading to trust in other things than God. And how easily does this impatience lead to actions that do not glorify God, because they are against God's will. But even Aaron's behavior, even Aaron's behavior is a reminder, especially, especially for all in leadership, peer pressure or the desire to please people. How easily can this lead to decisions that do not glorify God? We should be aware of our own sinful nature as we look at this, the sin of the people of Israel. Let's have a look at the second scene. Scene number two, God's anger and Moses' intercession, verses 7 to 14. God shows his anger over the sin of the people and Moses, he intercedes for the people. Now, when God says to Moses, your people have acted corruptly, in verse, seven, in verse 7, God is not blaming Moses. It looks a little bit like God is blaming Moses, right? But he is not blaming Moses for the people's sin. We remember that God, God calls the people usually my people, right? But here he says to Moses, your people. Rather, what God is doing here is he gives Moses the assignment, the order to deal with the people's sin. And God makes it clear that the people had broken his commandment. The people had created an idol. They had worshipped it. They had sacrificed to it, reflecting their belief that it could bless them. And they said that this idol had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Then in verses 9 to 10, it, it almost sounds like God had given up on his people. God talks about destroying them. However, God had not given up on them. Instead, he continues to challenge Moses. God was basically saying to Moses what he would do if Moses would not intercede. What he would do in case Moses would not mediate. God invites Moses to intercede on behalf of the people. And of course, Moses did not have the power to stop God from doing what he had planned to do. God is the sovereign one, the all-powerful one, the omnipotent one. And God knew already that Moses would intercede. 
we see that Moses was committed to God's original plan. God's original plan to make a great people out of Abraham's descendants. Now, how does Moses intercede now for the people? He appeals to God's honor. He appeals to God's character. He says in verse 12, Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out with an evil intent to kill them in the mountain? Moses reminds God of his covenant that he had made with, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he had sworn to them to give this land to their descendants. So Moses appeals to God's faithfulness, to God's character. And God? God responds to this prayer and relents. He gives in. Does this mean God did not expect this outcome? Does this mean he was taken by surprise? When he relented? No, God was not taken by surprise. God was in every single moment the Almighty One, the, the Sovereign One. But Moses' prayer is, in is a great example of God answering the prayer of a righteous person. It's an example of God answering the prayer of a person who does not pray egoistically. It's an example of God answering the prayer that was prayed according to God's will. Did this mean now that God would not punish the Israelites at all? No. We heard already about the plague, the epidemic, at the end of our sermon text. So it's not like God is saying, well, it happened, but no hard feelings, just make sure it will not happen again. No, it's not like that. God is perfect. He is perfectly just. But at the same time, he is perfectly merciful. God remained their God. And the people remained his people in spite of their great sin. They remained his kingdom of priests and a holy nation, as he had called them earlier, in spite of their sin. He had created them to be his people. Now, is there any lesson for us? Oh, yes. More lessons than we have time to look at. Even for us, there is a great risk of putting our trust in idols. How much do you trust your bank account? How much do you trust your education? Or how much do you trust your CV or your work experience? Or how much do you trust your reputation or your basta? Even for us, there is a real danger of creating visible representations of God or of Jesus and focusing on, on these images or these icons instead of focusing on how they are presented in God's word. But even Moses' intercession prayer, how he is interceding for the people, how he approaches God, is an example for us. Do you desire to pray according to God's will? And if you don't know God's will in a specific matter, do you pray, your will be done, like Jesus has taught us in Matthew 6? Or is your own will the focus of your prayers? your own thoughts, your own desires? Are you concerned about God's honor and his name as you pray? How much do you rest in the comforting fact that God keeps his promises always? Now, before we spend more time to go deeper into applications, let's have a quick look at scene number three. Scene three, Moses' anger and the Levites' action. Moses' anger and the Levites' action, verses 15 to 29. On the way down from the mountain, Moses meets again Joshua. Joshua was still waiting for him. Obviously, Joshua was more patient than, than Aaron and the people. Joshua, Joshua, who was Joshua? He was a military leader and he knew the sound 
of war and the sound of fighting. The fact that Joshua thought there was a war in the camp, it gives us an idea what kind of party this must have been. It must have been wild. And when Moses saw what was going on in the camp, that the people had started to worship an idol, what does he do? He smashes the two tablets. Now the two tablets was more than just two pieces of stone. Those were the most valuable documents on earth at that time. Stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. Now what does Moses do when he is smashing these tablets? He shows symbolically that the people had broken the covenant with God. Like he was breaking these two stone tablets. Now what does Moses do then? Then Moses destroyed the idol, burned it up, grounded it to powder, and made the people drink this mix of charcoal and gold powder. Ooh, can you imagine the taste? But the people would discard this, this powder again as, as waste. Moses did everything he could to ensure that this material was totally desecrated, totally profaned, and could never be taken again to make any idol. Then beginning in verse 21, Moses confronts Aaron, his older brother, and acting co-leader during Moses' absence. What does Aaron do? He tries to calm down Moses. However, instead of admitting his failure, Aaron starts this, this old game of blaming others. First, he blames the people. He describes them as being intent on evil, verse 22. And then he kind of indirectly blames Moses because he had stayed away such a long time and nobody knew what had happened to him. Verse 23. And finally, he seems to blame higher forces, fate, when he says that he threw the gold into the fire and what came out? This calf. In verse 26, Moses gives the the, the people an opportunity to repent. He gives them a chance to show if their allegiance is with the Lord. And God himself had made it clear to Moses that all who are not for the Lord shall be killed. Verse 27. Idolatry is not a trivial offense. It's not a small sin. And the Levites, they make it publicly clear that they are for the Lord. And they follow Moses' commandment to kill the unrepentant. The result, many were killed on that day. Now, it is crucial to realize that this was an important and very specific point in Israel's history. This was not a, a general instruction to kill idolaters. And the new covenant, based on on Jesus' death and resurrection, does not allow killing in order to remove unrepentant believers. Uh, unbelief, uh, sorry, unrepentant believers, yes. But at this specific point in Israel's history, the obedience of the Levites in killing the unrepentant relatives confirmed their devotion to God. That's what Moses says here in, in verse 29. Their obedience confirmed the Levites special role as a clergy tribe, as a, as a priestly tribe within Israel. How about us? Are we as horrified as Moses and the Levites were when we see that divine, uh, divine truth is abandoned, God's commandments are broken? Do we feel as shocked as they felt? Do we see and feel sin to be disastrous and deserving death? Do we see the need, the importance to get rid of idolatry within ourselves and within the community of believers? Now, sometimes we are quite good in, in recognizing sin in others, right? 
uh, but not that good in recognizing sin in ourselves. When was the last time you asked God to reveal sin in your life so that you can repent and become more like Jesus? And if you identified an idol in your life, what did you do with it? Did you destroy it completely, like Moses? Or did you store it somewhere, just in case? Did you ground it to powder to make sure you can never again worship it more than you worship God? It reminded me of a dear brother in Christ many years ago. His teenage son was struggling with the amount of time he was spending in playing computer games. He followed Jesus, but he spent every week many hours playing computer games. So his parents actually did what godly and loving parents are supposed to do. They limited the times their son was allowed to play these games. However, the son was so much into computer games that he disobeyed his parents and started playing when his parents were leaving the house or when he thought they were sleeping. So his father, he invited me and one other elder of the church we belonged to at that time, and he asked us to share our perspective on the whole situation with his son. And I was a bit shocked myself when I looked at this teenage boy and heard myself saying, if these games control you, you should get rid of them. Ouch. The boy was very shocked, not just a little bit. But by God's grace, that was exactly what this teenage boy did. He physically banned these games from his life. And you know what? He continued to grow in faith, in maturity, and is today a godly father himself. And I praise God for him whenever I think about him. Now coming back to Moses and the Levites, I hope, I hope they challenge our complacency. They challenge our contentment when we see that God's commandments are broken, when there is idolatry in our own lives or in lives of others. I hope it challenges us to call sin what it is, namely sin. To stay silent when we see sinful behavior is actually unloving. Because the eternal destiny of the sinner is at stake. It's really a matter of life and death. Let's have a look at the last scene of our text today. The fourth scene, Moses' intercession and God's punishment. Let me read this quickly again, verses 30 to 35. The following day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a grave sin. They have made a God of gold for themselves. Now if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. See, my angel will go before you. But on the day I settle accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. And the Lord inflicted a plague on the people for what they did with the calf Aaron had made. So Moses approaches God confesses the sin, and asks for forgiveness. Did you realize something? Moses did not try to make this sin a little bit smaller. That's not what he tried to do. He calls it a grave sin, a tremendous sin. Because they had the commandments, and because they had the commandments, there was actually no excuse. They were breaking the second commandment. And to give his request for forgiveness more weight, Moses offers his own life in case forgiveness is not possible in verse 32. And God, 
God makes it very clear in verse 33 that he maintains his standard of justice. We just read that God said, Whoever has sinned against me, I will erase from my book. Verse 33. Now, what does sin have to do with God's book? What kind of book are we talking about here? What is this book about? Well, this refers to a practice of the ancient world that clans or cities would have a list that included the people that were currently living, that were currently belonging to that clan or that city. This list was called the Book of Life or the Book of the Living because it contained only names of those who were actually alive. So every time a new baby was born, its name would be added to the book. And every time someone died, the name would be erased, would be blotted out from the book. And God tells Moses here that those who sinned against him by breaking the covenant will be blotted out, will be erased from the book. With other words, whoever has sinned against God will die. But before God continues to talk about his judgment, he does something quite interesting. He instructs Moses in verse 34 to move on and to lead the people to the place he had told Moses about. So God commands Moses to continue with this exodus plan, this plan to bring them to the promised land. God is faithful to his initial plan. God answers Moses' prayer we saw in verses 11 to 14. And not only that, God promises that his angel will go before them. The angel went previously before them. And, and the angel would continue to guide them. And the promised land was still their destination. After that, God confirms that there will be judgment at some point of time in the future. So he will not destroy them, but he will hold them accountable for their sin as a nation. Now this probably does not refer to the plague, to the epidemic mentioned in verse 35, which might have been just a warning that sin is serious, a small warning. The plague was not the ultimate judgment for breaking the covenant with God. We even don't know how many, or if anyone, died at all from this plague. But God gives sometimes small samples, so to say, of bigger things that are to come as warnings. We did this before. Think about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Looking back, we see that Israel would experience the ultimate judgment centuries later, when their land was destroyed and the people were led into exile. But here in Exodus 32, the Israelites must have already understood the severity, the seriousness of sin. Now, what does all this mean for us today as believers of the New Covenant, as Christians? Let's have a look at three applications. Application number one, Jesus the better intercessor. Jesus the better intercessor. So, the Holy God is still the same today. And sin today is as terrible as it was three and a half thousand years ago. And humans are by nature and by choice as sinful today as they were at Moses' times. And the only thing humans have rightfully deserved is death, is eternal death, eternal separation from God. God's holy and just wrath is on sinners today as it was on sinners at Moses' times. And even today, humans have no excuse. That's what the Bible tells us. But God's mercy is also the same. And Moses was actually a foreshadow. He was a pointer to the perfect intercessor, the perfect mediator, Jesus Christ. Did you realize what, what Moses said here in uh, verse uh, 30, second part of verse uh, 30? He said to the Israelites, 
Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. Perhaps. Moses was not sure. How different is this with Jesus? The ultimate intercessor, the ultimate mediator, our ultimate high priest. He did not just go up to the Lord on a mountain and stayed 40 days on a mountain. Jesus went up to the Lord to return to, this, to his heavenly dwelling place 40 days after his resurrection. Moses had this office just a couple of years on earth. Jesus, he rose from the dead, lives forever, and holds this priestly office permanently. That's what we, what we read in Hebrews 7. Moses was not sure if God would forgive the people. Now, how about Jesus? Let's have, we need to read this. Let's have a look at Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, verse 25. How about Jesus? Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Why? We find the answer here. Since he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus always lives to intercede. And if you come to God through Jesus, your name is also written in a book. Not an earthly book, but the book of life of the Lamb who was slaughtered. That's Jesus. Different from the ancient books of life, names entered in the book of life of the Lamb will not be erased. This means you will live forever. You will have eternal life. You will spend eternity together with God, with Jesus, and with this vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Where? In this new creation, on the new earth. What a glorious future lies ahead of us. Jesus is the better, the perfect intercessor, the perfect mediator. If you did still not come to God through Jesus, do so today. But there's also a second application, application number two. Idols are not neutral. Idols are not neutral. Or maybe you're wondering, what do you, do you mean, idols are not neutral? You just said earlier, idols are dead materials. They have no power. Well, yes. Idols, like images, or statues, or cars, or smartphones, or money, they are dead material. But even this dead material poses a risk, a risk of pulling you away from God. It presents a risk of drawing you to this visible material, if it takes God's place in your life. Any idol is actually like a magnet, like a magnet draws metal to itself, an idol pulls you to itself, away from God. And if you put your trust in these dead materials, if, if you rely on these dead things that pull you away from God, it damages, it destroys your relationship with God. So from this perspective, idols are not neutral. And they make you break the first commandment. First commandment was, do not have other gods besides me. Now, sometimes people say, I like to think of God as dot, dot, dot. And then they mention what they like to think of God. Did you hear this before? They create their own mental image, their own imagination of God. And usually they don't accept other uh, character features of God, other personality uh, parts of God. Well, if such a mental image, if such an imagination is not matching who God really is, if this is not in line with God as he reveals himself in his word, then this is in fact an idol. It's idol worship. And even very sincere, very genuine worship of this mental image, of this imagination of God, does not make it pleasing to the living God because it is not honoring him as he is. So I want to encourage you this morning to read his word, to meditate on his word, to learn more 
who this living God is and worship him the way he wants to be worshipped. Maybe you think, well, some representation of the true God, of Jesus, can be very helpful. Maybe you think that an icon or a crucifix or a picture of Jesus or something like that, that it can strengthen your devotion, your worship, your focus on God. Well, some of us have met last Wednesday in the men's group meeting and we have studied J.I. Packer's Knowing God. And J.I. Packer shows in this book that images like uh, statues, icons, they hide, they conceal God's glory. And they convey false ideas about God. So they hide God's glory and they convey false ideas about God. For example, a crucifix hides the fact that Jesus gloriously resurrected from the dead. He's not on the cross anymore. Or an image of a kind and tender looking Jesus conveys the false idea that he really had a face like that. So there is a risk that these images are treated as representations and not just like symbols. And then the second commandment is broken. Then you are not worshipping the living God. So it's actually better to worship God based on how he reveals himself in his word, in the Bible. Let's have a look at the third and last application. Application number three, God is faithful, even if we are not. God is faithful, even if we are not. We have seen that God did not give up on his exodus plan with his people. For the ancient people of Israel, the big question must have been, can God really continue with us? After we have broken his, his covenant in such an offensive way, can he really continue his plan with us? We see that God was faithful to himself. He had rescued them out of slavery in Egypt and he had not given up on them. He continues his plan with them. And you know what? God is still the same. Paul wrote this to his uh, young brother, in, uh, Timothy. Um, he wrote uh, to him about his faithfulness. And uh, do you know what he wrote? Let, let me quickly read this. Uh, 2 Timothy 2. Let me read from verse 11, verses 11 to 13. He's writing, This saying is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is faithful to himself, to his plan, even if we are not faithful to him. So, if you are a child of God, if you belong to his people, and you have doubts this morning if God can really continue with you, if he still loves you after, after all that happened, after you may have disappointed him, I like to encourage you this morning, based on his word, God is faithful. The gospel message, the good news of Jesus and him taking our sins, this message does not expire after you became a child of God. This truth is still true. And it will be true until God accomplished his plan and brought you to his eternal home. He is faithful. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we worship you. You are indeed the faithful one. And we thank you for reminding us of your faithfulness this morning through your holy word. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the better intercessor, the better mediator. 
And Jesus died for our sins on that cross. There was no perhaps. There was complete assurance when he said, it is finished. Lord, you have also reminded us this morning of the danger of idols. And we thank you for this reminder. As we live in a world filled with potential idols, we need this reminder. Lord, we pray that we may know you more and more. We pray that you may continue to increase our desire to know you more. And Lord, we pray that our worship might be a pleasing sacrifice to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.